All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Cale Casey. I'm one of the information officers with the Alaska Interagency Incident Management Team on the east zone of the Cedar Creek Fire. We welcome you to tonight's virtual meeting, and we're here at Mount Bachelor Ski Area. On behalf of Norm McDonald and our entire team and the Deschutes National Forest, thank you, Mount Bachelor, for hosting over 700 firefighters at this fantastic camp up here. We're gonna go ahead and tell you a little bit about the camp so folks can jump online and join us. And whether you're watching live or on the rebroadcast, please put your questions in the comments. We have several public information officers from the Alaska team, from the Oregon State Fire Marshals team, and also from Pacific Northwest Team 3 over on the West Zone monitoring for comments. Again, we're here at Mount Bachelor and it's been a big deal for us to have this incredible facility. And we also want to thank folks for driving slowly when you're going by the snow parks, especially with all the smoke. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our incident meteorologist, Chris Foltz. And Chris helps us understand the weather, and he's going to give you a little outlook here for the next few days. Here you are, Chris. All right, thanks, Cale. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Cale mentioned, my name is Chris Foltz. I'm one of the incident meteorologists that are assigned to the fire. I'm on the east zone. We also have an incident meteorologist working with the Pacific Northwest Team 3 on the west side as well. Uh, just talking a little bit about the weather conditions. Certainly, we had a very active pattern over the weekend uh, with the strong gusty winds. As we've gotten into this week, uh, the main focus really has been the smoke. You know, there's a lot of smoke out there, as Kayla had mentioned. Um, do appreciate everybody you know, being cautious out there. Visibilities have dropped down to as low as a quarter of a mile at times. Uh, in terms of the actual weather, um, temperatures have been actually very seasonable. Temperatures in the 60s, you know, overnight lows have started to dip down, feel more fall-like. And as we go through the week, the rest of this week, we're going to see very similar conditions. Only at the highest elevations are we seeing any, any wind gusts of uh, above 15 miles per hour. At the lower elevations, the winds have really remained, generally speaking, 5 to 10 miles per hour. So the relative humidities have been much higher than they were last week, which has really, I think, helped firefighting efforts. So, but as we go to this weekend, we are going to see a little bit of a pattern shift that's actually going to bring even cooler temperatures in to the area, as well as the potential for some precipitation, especially as we go Saturday night into the day on Sunday. So be mindful of that. You know, we'll have to watch that as we get closer to that time period. But uh, certainly we're here to support the fire crews and also provide information out to the public as, uh, as it is needed. So that's all I have. Okay, Chris, one second. Yes. So it is windy up at the Mount Batcher ski area. Yes, it and is. Folks are probably feeling wind on the east zone. Yes. Is that impacting the fire right now? At this point, again, the strongest winds are above the fire uh, for the most part. There certainly is the potential that, you know, over you know, in some areas we could see the winds come down to the surface. But, but generally speaking, where the fire activity is, the winds are lighter. So thankfully, we're not seeing the winds driving that fire like what we saw you know, Friday into Saturday specifically. And then do these cooler temperatures help us? Because it's definitely much cooler out. Last night, all the firefighters camping here mentioned it dropped significantly absolutely yeah we are seeing you know temperatures in some areas as low as the the mid to upper 30s that trend's going to continue into this weekend um, as far as um, where things are going and how those temperatures impact the, the fire certainly the, the the lower the temperatures we do have uh, that moisture still in place uh, so we are seeing those higher relative humidity so the combination of a little bit more moisture in the area along with those cooler temperatures has let that humidity values come up especially overnight Overnight, we're seeing relative humidity values recovering between 80 and 100%. So that's really helpful in kind of slowing that uh, fire activity. Um, I know John's going to talk a little bit about fire behavior and how that weather ties into how the fire actually behaves. Great. That's a perfect segue. Right. Let's go ahead and hand that over to John. John Stuchel, for those of you who have been watching our YouTube channel, we've been doing a behind the scenes feature. And John's one of our specialists that we get to work with in the Alaska team. He has a lot of local knowledge here. And those of you who have been watching online and those special behind the scenes clips get to hear what he tells the firefighters every morning at 0600. Well, good evening, John Stuchel, fire behavior analyst for the Alaska Incident Management Team. I'll talk about the fire behavior. We'll talk about the weather. There's, it's all about relationships. There's three parts to fire behavior, fuel, weather, topography. So we've heard about the weather, these cooler temperatures. We'll get around with the fuels. Right now with the cooler temperatures and the higher relative humidities, the fuels, they start out at what, what, what we call one hour fuel, which is basically a grass blade to a pencil, then 10 hour fuel, which is a pencil to a one inch stick, then a one inch stick to a three inch stick is your 100 hours, then a three inch up to eight is a thousand. Those are the fuels we worry about and I look at. This season here, this summer, we had a long green season, but 
those fuels are really dry. We're still above what they call energy release component. We're still above the 90th percentile, which means that if you had a large fire, no action taken, it would become large, 90% of them. So that's where we're at is we have super dry fuels, and then we've had the change in this weather pattern. This weather pattern really started at first, as you know, we were working, looking at the east winds. That's where the growth went to the west. And then all of a sudden it rapidly changed. As you know, in this country, this weather can change in a heartbeat. Sunday around 11 o'clock, we had noticed that we had weather changing. And it was all of a sudden started blowing from the south. Winds carrying the smoke up to the north and then over to the east as we're observing today. And that's really the pattern we have right now. What's really helping the firefighters doing all the work that they're doing out remotely along the edges, hardening that up is an anticipation. The slopes and the terrain features are not real conducive to a lot of crews working in that ground. And particularly the biggest thing is we talk about, one of my messages is pay attention to where you're at in that terrain with the weather. How's the wind going? The other thing is we don't have a real fat, rapid rate of spread. It's been up to maybe 20 feet per minute, but we've had spotting potential up to over almost seven tenths of a mile with what they call probability of ignition, which means that if 100 embers landed on receptive fuel bed, how many fires would we have started? We started out at 70%, 75%. We're currently at 45%. And for a baseball analogy, if you're a baseball player that hit 45% of the time, that's a 450 batter. So you'd be doing real well. But that's generally the message right now is we're getting to do some good work because of this weather. RHs are going up. So then the live fuels, those, those uh, one hour and 10 hour fuels are going up and then they go back down. They're, we're back to normal again right now, but the RHs are expected. And with that, that's the message I give. Okay, great. And I'm gonna ask one preemptive question okay. because when that big west wind pushed the fire to Lemish Lake, it really has pretty much stayed here for some days. And folks have been asking a lot about little cultus, cultus, all these values in beloved areas, a lot of tradition in fishing and generations in the past, but it's been holding right here. Is there a fuel change in here? Is this fuel bed different than anywhere else? Or why is it holding right there? There's a slight change of the fuels there. We've gone through from the real old growth to the dug fur with the Spanish moss or old man's beard. And we're dropping down maybe a little more of the component, which is the, uh, lodgepole pine in that. But the, really the big thing is we've had real low winds. That's really been what's been helping us out. And also the spotting distance is getting shorter. But as you know, we're now, we're on the east slopes of the Cascades. This is not a west slope fire. This is an east slope fire. So we're also going to that fall change. I've already said, doing a lot of initial attack up in Spokane, the transition's what gets you. So we've transitioned down. We've been We've been able to manage and keep hanging on to the thing. And now we're just waiting if there's going to be another weather change. Or as we know, in the fall, we get one of those dry cold fronts as the weather pattern changes because we're getting one maybe in the future talking to Chris about from Alaska. So we're starting to get that Alaskan influence coming down. So, yeah, that's the big thing. It's just the whole thing. Hopefully these guys will have this all hardened up. So when it does make the run, it's going to stop at a fire line. Great. Thank you, John. And we can pass that microphone over to Jake Livingston. You've been seeing Jake in the mornings and he's our one of our operations chiefs. There's four in the fire. Jake, how about a, a, a summary of today? All right. Good evening. My name is Jake Livingston, one of the operations chiefs with the Alaska team. I'll just start out by talking about uh, how we're, we're uh, working to confine this fire. We're using a a point protection and confinement strategy uh, using the, the road systems and some of the natural features out there, such as the lakes and uh, you know lava flow up in this area. Um, when I say uh, a point protection, that means we're just, we're identifying all the values at risk out there, structures, uh, uh, homes, ski areas, that sort of thing, and then ordering supplies. Um, if the conditions change, we, it doesn't mean we won't look at options to go direct on this incident. Uh, one of the reasons we're not going directly on the fire's edge is a snag hazard. Um, just uh, scouting out the area with the ground personnel, they've, they've seen and heard a lot of trees coming down, and it's just not a safe option for us to stick people out directly on the fire's edge. Uh, so we're, we're choosing the option that we feel is, has the most chance for success. And then just a little bit of scale, uh, 
to consider our portion of the fire um, has about 35 miles of perimeter to deal with. So it's really a, a large, a large area. Um, as far as our operations today and over the last couple days and then the days into the future, uh, I'll discuss that starting on the southern end. Uh, we have the Odell Lake area and the Highway 58 corridor. We have about 210 personnel <clears throat> down there today. Uh, they're evaluating and assessing all the structures along Odell Lake, uh, finding out what's there, identifying where they're at so they can communicate that to the other members of the team. They're ordering supplies for it, uh, and that work will continue on there for days. Uh, they're also looking at prepping the Highway 58 corridor out toward the zone break with uh, Pacific Northwest Team 3, our neighbors to the west. And what we're doing there is uh, coordinating closely so their actions can meet up and with ours so we can have a, uh, a clean transition there. As we move to the east and a little north, we have the, the 46 corridor here, Cascade Lakes Highway. And then between that, we have the Odell, the Lava Odell Road, it's the 4668 road, and then the 4660 road on the other side. We're, we're going in there and doing uh, prep work on those, removing the vegetation on the north and westerly side of that, um, working 100 feet in. It's a shaded fuel break. We're not removing every tree. We're trying to keep 40-foot spacing within that 100-foot area. So the idea is to work across there, create a, a line we might be able to use in the future, tie into the Highway 46, Cascade Lakes Highway. Um, and then we have three divisions with several hundred personnel, um, equipment, hand crews, fire engines. They're working on the west side of the highway, 100 feet in, uh, also with a shaded fuel break, 40 foot spacing, um, and just removing all the, the understory brush and, and those sort of things. So from Crane Prairie Reservoir, we have resources working to the south and to the north. In addition to prepping the road system, they're, they're looking at all the values at risk along the highway corridor, uh, structures, campgrounds, there's some resorts, Crane Prairie Resort, resort Col Coltis Lake Resort, um, and they're, they're doing assessments and all those. They've set up sprinklers, uh, pumps and hose, that sort of thing, and all that work continues. Um, and then up on the furthest west corner of Crane Prairie Reservoir, we have the 700 Road, which shoots up towards Coltis Mountain. And then there's a little Coltis Lake there. They're identifying uh, that road system and as a, a possible control feature for the future. Um, and then we move further north towards Lava Lake. We've had personnel over or up at Lava Lake Resort, uh, assessing that, setting up sprinklers, the sprinklers, the same sort of thing. Um, we've also been looking out to the east, east of Crane Prairie Reservoir, Wikiup Reservoir, just looking at options there for the future, just planning ahead if in the event uh, fire did move that way. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, I got a quick question for right. you. It's similar to John Stutzel's too, because when when we first got the fire about five days ago, you had firefighters directly on the fire line, and you were working this edge direct to, as a checking action. And it really has not moved that much from this area. Tell me about that action, because that bought you some time out here to get people in place. What were folks doing, and then what were you seeing in terms of spotting? And there were some strange winds in there, weren't there? Yeah. So. Uh, initially, we were using the 4290 road, which uh, goes west out towards Charlton Lake and then north Waldo. And we were working uh, personnel along the that southern edge of the fire and with aircraft further out to the east along there to, to slow progression so we could uh, do prep work along the 4290 road. Hope, we were hoping to use that as a, a control line, but the fire did advance probably a mile just under a mile to the south. So and it, it went over the 4290 road. So that was no longer a viable option. Uh, the proximity to the fire edge and where all the personnel uh, were working was too close. And, and then egress out of there, if it got really active, was not, it wasn't viable. Okay, and then we've had a lot of questions online about the retardant ships. Why are we having the big retardant ships out there? We have put up the videos of the scoopers working and there's an excellent shot that our air attack took of the scooper dropping on I think this edge over here, what's the advantage of the scoopers at cooling an edge versus a retardant ship? Well, the scoopers are really effective when there's a body of water close to scoop out of. 
so they can scoop out, drop, and then return uh, real quickly. So they're really, it's effective that way with, with quick turnarounds and we can get a lot of water on the ground fast. And then also, uh, there's a lot of sensitive uh, issues out here with water, a lot of really pristine water, and, and we don't want to re use retardant around those areas because it, it could uh, damage damage that. Okay, great, thanks. Appreciate that. You can right. um, actually, I'll take this one because, right. and then if you want to see the structure protection at the Cultus Lake Resort and Lodge, that's also on YouTube. The sprinklers, the hose lays, the pumps, and of course the fire is still very far away, so that lake hasn't been impacted at all, and you can see that online. Okay, now we're going to send it over to our partner, Stefan Myers, with the Oregon State Fire Marshals. And he's over actually at the Oak Ridge Camp, and he's going to tell us about the Oregon State Fire Marshals and their work in the Odell Lake area and in this area. Stefan? Good afternoon. Glad to be with you. Uh, again, Stefan Myers with the uh, Oregon State Fire Marshals office. Uh, yeah, we were called to this fire uh, on Saturday. Most of our mission has been on the West End, uh, working to protect homes and communities. Um, but we have been uh, recognizing that there are some communities to the south. Um, so we've been doing some tactical patrols in that area and coordinating with local resources. Um, that is what our uh, mission is, uh, is to support those local resources and work with them um, to make sure that we don't lose any homes uh, and to protect these communities. Uh, we are on a glide path to um, the end of this week where we'll be demobilizing demobilizing uh, some of our task forces. That's being done in concert with both the Alaska team and team three that are here uh, with the idea that uh, the risks to some of these communities um, have started to lower, uh, but we are available and ready to mobilize if that was to change. Great, thanks, Stefan. And before we move on to our, our, our sheriff partner's office, when the Alaska team first came down here, we had some members of the public make comments about how unusual it might be to them to have the Alaska team down here. Well, this team is no stranger to Oregon. We were on the bootleg fire last year where we worked with Stefan. Uh, we've been working with the Oregon State Fire Marshals for many, many years. And in fact, we keep in touch in the off season. That's how close the fire family is here. We're going to go ahead and move it over to our uh, Deschutes Sergeant, Nathan Garibay. Nathan? Yeah, good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I think uh, the update we have tonight is uh, as of today, and I, uh, I believe the, uh, the Deschutes National Forest may be able to speak a little bit more to this. Uh, the Deschutes National Forest did update their forest closure and uh, those that forest closure aligned with our areas that had been under uh, evacuation notice. So at this time, just to avoid con uh, confusion, we've really transitioned uh, to their uh, forest closure uh, as opposed to our evacuation. So uh, if the circumstances uh, indicate that we would increase evacuations uh, around that uh, immediate area, then we can do so uh, quickly. Uh, but at this time, uh, you know, through coordinated effort with the Forest Service, the incident management team, uh, and the uh, Oregon State Fire Marshal's Office, I think there was some agreement that uh, this would be the cleanest and, and probably most sensible way to communicate what areas people should avoid. I would like to just go back September, around September 1st, we uh, initiated uh, the first evacuation notices as a result of the Cedar Creek fire in Deschutes County, and that was done jointly with Lane County uh, Sheriff's Office. Uh, over, you know, the last 12, 13 days, uh, we've expanded those uh, evacuation areas uh, based on threat to populations. I would say that uh, this area is all national forest with a few private in holdings uh, interior to some of that those forest boundaries. Um, and th that does provide us some challenges to evacuation, uh, unlike evacuating a community uh, of homes where you know where the homes are. Um, this really required us to get out into the forest and try to find people. We utilized some tools such as wireless emergency alerts, which uh, notified uh, people uh, through their cell phone whether they had been signed up or not. Now, the, the upside to that is we, we can notify people that might be visiting from this area and aren't signed up for our local emergency alerting system. Uh, however, the downside is probably some people in the Lapine area did get that notice, so it's really important uh, when you get those emergency alerts, particularly the WIA alerts, that you, you look at that message and make sure that it applies to you because, unfortunately, we can't quite geotarget it as well as we would like. Uh, but we uh, utilize that tool, both Lane County uh, and Deschutes County utilize those tools at different times over the last uh, almost two weeks. 
to um, let people know uh, out in the forest and the wilderness areas that they needed to uh, uh, evacuate. And uh, it, was, it was also a really concerted effort by a number of agency, uh, Forest Service personnel, sheriff's deputies, and uh, to um, locate, identify people uh, that might have been in harm's way in, that, in those forest areas. So that, uh, I think uh, that's all I have for an update, unless there's any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, you, uh, Sergeant Garibay. We'll go ahead and bring in at the end if we have questions for you. And now moving over to Lane County, Sheriff Cliff Harold. Sheriff Harold. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, with respect to uh, over here on the west side, uh, the weekend provided us uh, quite a lot of activity when the weather was pushing the fire this direction and um, required a significant evacuation uh, level adjustments. Um, using all of those sorts of tools that uh, Sergeant Garibay just described. Um, and then thankfully we've been able to reduce those. So today uh, we made another reduction for uh, the cities of Oak Ridge and Westboro, uh, getting them back down from a two down into a one with the exception of areas uh, that are closest to the fire. So there's a band of uh, zones that are um, on the east side of Oak Ridge and uh, closest to the fire that remain in a two. So we're wanting people to continue to have that um, be set frame of mind be ready to leave on a moment's notice if uh if weather changes and causes us to have to do that but uh thankful that we've been able to reduce things down get get folks back into the town um evacuating the entire uh, cities of oak ridge and westford over the weekend went really really smoothly because the community um just responded really terrifically and i just continue to be thankful uh and impressed by our communities and the way that uh, they respond the way they look out for each other um, and uh, the relationships with the fire teams, with uh, our friends at the Deschutes County Sheriff's Office, super thankful for uh, great relationships as we work through these things. So uh, with that, I will stop. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sheriff Clifford. Appreciate that. And I just want to make a quick distinction, folks, between evacuation levels and forced closures and closure space. Sometimes they are the same because the activity and then things change. The sheriffs are working very hard to get people home, but the areas that are impacted are still impacted with heat, with dangers, with snags, with fire personnel. So those are two separate topics. <clears throat> Just wanted to make sure that that's clear. All right, and now Kevin Larkin, our Bend, Fort Rock, District Ranger, and also our, our agency administrator. Kevin. Thanks, Kale, and, and thanks to everybody for taking the time tonight out of your nights to learn about this fire and all that is going on. I, I just really appreciate the involvement that you've all had and definitely appreciate all that, that the Alaska team and Pacific Northwest Team 3 have committed to this and sharing information with, with the folks who care deeply about these places. Um, as, as you've heard from us, this has been a complicated fire from the start. It's defied a lot of the, the more simple tactics and strategies that we might take on and we would want to take on to um to go after suppression fire such as this and it's it's been hard to manage it's been hard to go direct on this fire since the start and you've you've heard tonight that conditions are, are improving we have we're getting into fall we're having shorter days we have a good weather period right now and things are are definitely looking optimistic for us in, in terms of containing this fire but those complexities still are present, all the complexities that were there from the start, the terrain, the the vegetation type, the all the, the, the fuel type, all that stuff is still there. And now we also have 90 plus thousand acres of fire on the landscape. And so the, the ability to um, put firefighters and resources on the ground to do the work that's that's needed just becomes that much more challenging. So the idea that, you know, well, if we all wanna go, hey, we got good weather, we got a good break, let's go direct on this and, and catch it, that's, not as simple as as it would appear so the other piece that, that i want to make sure we all understand is is at least here on the east slope and the central oregon we're not out of fire season um friday's nine, i'm sorry excuse me september 9th was the anniversary of the start of the pole creek fire in 2012. we have a good history we chased that fire for four or six weeks and we have a good history of, of fire well into the fall here so we we can't get complacent. We can't assume that just because we've got a, a good forecast for the next little bit that everything is going to be fine for the remainder of fire season. And so with that, the Alaska team has a really great plan. 
They, they have a great plan to, to make sure that we do what's right for this fire and we, we keep everybody safe. We keep the fire out of all those areas that we all care deeply about, that we all really, really want to go spend time at next summer. Like, I, I can't wait to go have a beer on the deck at Cultus Lake, just being honest. Um, so we, they have a great plan and we need to help them out. We all need to help them out to be able to execute that plan. And so you'll see a little bit of an expanded footprint in the forest closure on the Deschutes National Forest right now. It's going to go a little bit to the east into the Twin Lakes area and, and some of the areas around um, Wikiup and then down toward the south. You, I've seen a lot of comments here about referring to um, areas down near the Lama Pass and down toward Odell Lake. And we're just trying to give those folks the, the maximum space and time they need because they're doing some dangerous work, some, some heavy equipment work and, and a lot of things that can get people in trouble if you're uh, Kind of getting yourself into the wrong place so we just ask your patience ask you to stay to abide by the the restrictions that we have and the closures that we have we'll open things back up just as soon as it's safe for people to be back in there but we just need a little bit more patience um, going forward for now so with that I'll, I'll pass it back to you i just want to say thanks to everybody for all the time and commitment to this and uh, we really appreciate it thanks Kel. great thank you kevin and next up from Alaska, our incident commander and chief of fire and aviation back home, no stranger to hunting seasons being closed and trying to get them back open, no stranger to major road systems being closed. We only have a couple and trying to get them back out open, Norm McDonald. All right, afternoon or evening, everybody. Thanks, Kel, good uh, intro. Yeah, one of the things I did want to point off is uh, our team is just really happy to be here. Uh, in Alaska this year, we had a record fire season. We burned about three and a half million acres. Uh, we imported 27 teams just like ours and over 3,000 firefighters. And a lot of those came from right here, Region 6, uh, Oregon and Washington. So, Cal, when we got the order to come down here, we could have not been happier about uh, returning the favor, come down here to support both of the Deschutes and the Willamette National Forest, and, and more importantly, or just as importantly, uh, the communities around here. A lot of the, the firefighters that came up and helped us this summer are right from these communities, uh, Bend and, and Oak Ridge, and that's where they're out of. That's their backyard. Uh, so we're glad to be here. Uh, we've been engaged here for five days. Uh, we came right as uh, right in as uh, uh, Northwest Six uh, was having their hands full on that east side with the winds. Uh, we were able to come in right behind them, take that load off on the east side, and get right to work. So as uh, Jake pointed out, a lot of good work done over there. A lot more to do, um, but we've uh, we've really got a good strategy. I feel uh, that we're going to be the most successful, and, and that's the one we picked. Um, as was pointed out a couple times here, we've got a little lull in the weather over the next week. So that's our chance to take advantage of that, uh, reinforce those lines, really get everything set up. Because uh, one thing we know, and as Kevin pointed out, uh, fire season is not nearly over here in this part of the state. Uh, so we want to make sure over the next week we are getting everything done that we can to be successful. Uh, that's working on uh, that 46 corridor, uh, working around the structures on those lake communities, uh, getting as much prep work done as we can. So as that weather changes and the fire behavior changes, uh, we're set up for that. Um, last thing I want to point out is uh, um, we've been down here six times over the last, uh, since 2017. So we've worked with a lot of these teams around here, a lot of the folks, a lot of the hotshot crews, they're, they're uh, folks we know. Uh, we're really lucky to have just to our, our west, uh, Randy Johnson and the Pacific Northwest Team 3. Uh, I've known Randy for a long time. We've been talking a lot over the last couple of days. And the one thing we both have agreed on, this is uh, we got two teams here, but it's one fire. Uh, we're going to make sure we put the resources we have uh, where we need them, when we need, when we need them. If that's on the, the west side, uh, if they're getting another east wind event, we will move resources over there and help Randy out and those communities. And in return, when it's our turn, wind switch, he's got stuff he's going to share with us so we can make sure we're the most prepared and do the best job for the communities around here that we can. Uh, so with that, I think Randy's on the line. He was going to introduce himself and his team. Kale, I'm going to turn it back to you, and uh, I'll be around for any questions you all might have. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Norm. And we're going to go into our question and answer section here. We do have a member of Pacific Northwest Team 3, Stan Hinatsu, I believe, Sandy, and he'll be able to answer questions. But we're going to start with weather because we always do. Everybody wants to know about the weather. Are you going to speak for Chris? Okay. So... With cooler temps and potential rain, is there any hope within the next couple of weeks in Central Oregon for clean air? The biggest thing about the clean air and this cool temperature is with those winds, if you look at the satellite, 
the winds are coming from the south and west and what it is is pushing it up it's actually doing a big s but it's covering our area here so one of the things i always like to say is winds our friend because actually re one of the reasons there's smoke you're not getting a lot of movement of fire but we have a lot of interior fuels that are cleaning up it's called the consumption theory so we're actually cleaning up that for fire inside the rain thing to re realize that we won't do that but it, really the smoke is just pulling out and it's going to hang over here we're in camp we've been back and forth on the smoke watching the smoke rise smoke drop back down so it's hard to say what that is we that's one of the reasons we bring in an imet or an incident meteorologist is we monitor the weather or watch the weather and we do those updates daily okay great thanks do you want the next weather question or do you want to bring chris in is there a weather front expected that will make the fire run to the east again and very understandable that's, that's a scary event when they move that far east yeah absolutely so as far as uh, the weather like i said you really we only feel confident about looking at the next seven days and so certainly we can look at weather models that are further out but the further out you get from uh, the time that the weather model was run, the less reliable it becomes. So we really do try to focus on the near term, you know, the, the next couple of days for operations. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe through the weekend. So the, the next seven days are really where we're focusing because that's what's going to drive what the, you know, the, the response from the fire, um, the incident management team and the firefighters. Uh, in terms of just briefly, you know, I'm not seeing anything significant, you know, like what we saw this last weekend in the next seven days. I can say that. Like I said, we are expecting some precipitation this weekend. We're still yet to see exactly how much, but I'm hopeful we'll get at least a tenth of an inch of rain across most of the fire. I wouldn't be surprised if we see you know, a little bit more in some pockets. So again, that's not gonna knock the fire out, but that's certainly going to help the firefighters you know, continue to push forward with the efforts that they've got to try to, you know, to do their job and, and get, uh, get that fire under control. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Let's pass it over to Jason, because now we can combine those questions for Jake now that we know that in the next seven days, we don't have a major east wind event predicted, do you think the fire will come back east to Wikiup or Twin Lakes area? Um, I, it's hard to say what, what the fire will do. A lot of it will depend on what the, the weather is over the next several weeks. Uh, my hope would be that uh, a low pressure system would come in off the Pacific and rain at least a quarter inch on this fire. Uh, listening to fire behavior and the IMET uh, this area needs to receive at least a quarter inch of sustained rain, wind to, or rain to, to really check the fire spread. So it's hard to say um, if it will head east beyond that. Um, the further out you get, the less likely that is. Okay, and so um, a very straightforward question here. Where is the fire in regards to Cultus Lake? Okay, so on the east side here near Lemish Butte, uh, that's the furthest eastern progression of the fire. And Lemish Butte is about three miles west of the Cascade Lakes Highway. So uh, we're looking around six or seven miles from the main Coltis Lake area. Okay, thank you. And then a couple more for you, Jake. Um, and these are great questions. And then keep them coming too, because they are getting answered also by our information officers. How much of a fuel break are you making on the Cascades Highway? Highway 46. Okay, so our, our uh, specifications for our fuel break along the Cascade Lakes Highway, uh, right now we're just working on the west side of it and we're going 100 feet in off the edge of the road. We're removing every tree within 40 feet. So that creates a shaded fuel break. We're also removing all the, all the leaf or the, the timber litter underneath and then uh, shrubbery, uh, brush, that sort of thing. Okay, great. Here's a, a, it's not as straightforward one as people think, but because we went from a containment to no containment, that was incredibly confusing and it's incredibly yep. frustrating. As people look at this and they say, how do you go from 18% to 0%? The only way to understand that is to understand firefighting, right? You have to have an anchor, you have to be able to flank, you have to have something to hold on to to call a percentage point. So now right. the, we lost that when the right. fire grew. So that's fact, because we got to zero. Yep. What are the requirements to start regaining containment? Well, um, the requirements would be a weather change. Uh, so we'd need, uh, like I said, a quarter inch of rain. We did receive some rain yesterday, but it was, it was not enough. It was a really a short term thing. It will, it'll dry out pretty rapidly, especially given the conditions of the fuels prior to that rain event yesterday. So in order to go 
direct on the fire's edge, uh, we would need rain and then we would need to assess the area to make sure it was safe to go into. Um, we have assessed the, the fire edge here around Charlton Lake, Waldo Lake, and there are a lot of tree hazards there. And uh, snags and falling trees are one of the, uh, the largest hazards to firefighters out on the line. Okay, and that ties right into this uh, important question, and I think you, you just started to answer it. Why is the fire, what's the leading question, why is the fire not being actively engaged around Waddle Lake? Um, well, we, you know, we just didn't think it was a viable option just due to the tree hazards. Um, we didn't want to stick people in there and have the chance uh, that uh, someone would get stuck by, uh, struck by a snag. Uh, we, we have used a, a UAS, a drone in this area, to assess how much heat was still left on the fire perimeter, um, and then uh, just to actually get the location of the fire. But when the, the UAS pilots were out there yesterday on scene near Charlton Lake along the road there. Let's break that down. UAS? A drone. Thank you. Um, and this, this uh, small drone, it has infrared uh, capability. Uh, it's got a little camera so it can, it can fly through smoke and then give us information that we wouldn't normally be able to get because of visibility issues with a, a larger aircraft. Um, and what they saw was there was still active fire underneath the canopy of the timber. It was sheltered from the rain. Um, and while they were on scene there, they did hear numerous snags falling in the area. So that was uh, uh, indicated to us that it was a valid decision not to stick firefighters in there for safety reasons. Okay, and here's a really good question for folks who live out in the pine and, and, and much farther out than our immediate area. Um, talk a little bit about our, our pace model, our primary line, and then our alternate line, and what would what gives people farther out assurance that if this were to jump, let's say the Cascade Highway, that there's holding features on the, the next section over. Okay, so I mentioned uh, that we wanted to do, our actions were based on the highest probability of success. We evaluated going direct on the fire, we couldn't do it. We felt that building a control line along the highway was was the best option. Um, so we have the primary line, which is Cascade Lakes Highway 46. Um, and then right behind that, we have the Crane Prairie Reservoir. We have the Wikiup Reservoir and then Devil's Lake. Um, so those are some some features that already exist out there that are that are uh, barriers to fire spread. So we just need to connect in between them using the roadway. And then heading north up toward uh, Benchmark Butte, uh, this area in here, uh, Deschutes Bridge, there's a, a fuels project that was done done locally, so that's another barrier. So we have the fuels project, the lakes, um, and then going down. So we have the road, we have these other natural features, or unnatural, man-made reservoirs, but we have uh, people out further to the east, lookout mountain area, just assessing the, the road conditions out there as, as viable options for control lines. And then just, I know you're the man of the hour, of course, because everyone's in operations. So let's talk about night shift. Do you have people working at night? Yes, so we started a night shift tonight. That's down on the, the o Odell Lake side of things. Uh, it was just uh, about 40 personnel to start with, and then we'll expand over the next several days. And their job will just be have a presence in the Odell Lake area and then help coordinate uh, with PNW three incident management team on the west side as they come together here. We just want to have personnel in place to monitor this fire activity down on the Odell Lake side of things. Okay, great. And then who gets selected for a night shift? Because that, when I was a medic, those were always the hardest to go from operating all summer during the day to then being the people selected to stay up all night. Do you have a special list or how do you do that? Or is it just luck of the firefighter? Well, sometimes it's the luck of the draw, but what we do is we select someone and then We'll have them shadow the, the day operations out there for several days. They'll get good uh, information during the daylight, and then and then we'll transition them to night shift. And then we do select uh, um, you know highly qualified people to do that. Okay, great. And then if there were a new fire to start, or a big spot, or a lightning strike, do, is there an initial attack group, or how do you, how do you deal with something that would if there was something to start much farther out? We've been on incidents. We were on the bootleg when the fire, the new lightning came in and started to move all around us. And, and what's the response? Okay, so within these groups of personnel, firefighters working along the Cascade Lakes Highway corridor, we've identified uh, fire trucks, uh, 
equipment, uh, crews, um, as being, uh, when there's a fire, they're, they're already pre-identified. If there's a fire within the forest closure area, which uh, we're responsible for as far as responding to new fires, they're going to respond to it immediately. So they're already pre-identified and really poised to respond as needed. Okay, great. Thanks, Jake. I know I put you on the spot for quite a while. We'd like to move it over <clears throat> to Sergeant Garibay again, uh, and, it's, and it's actually a question about Klamath County evacuations, but it is, I, I think the Sergeant uh, can talk about it because in general, the counties have different processes uh, for alert systems, and I think uh, our local expert here will, will help us out. Over to you. Yeah, so um, we have been coordinating with Klamath, uh, much like we coordinated with Lane when uh, when there became um, some concern that this fire might impact or affect Klamath County. Klamath County was uh, involved, in, and we've been coordinating with them. The incident management teams have been uh, talking with the sheriff's office and emergency management down in Klamath County as well. As far as uh, alerting, uh, most of the uh, counties in the state of Oregon all have um, – uh, a, a pretty reasonable ability to alert. Um, if you're interested in signing up for alerts or making sure that you're on the list or registered to get emergency alerts, I would encourage you to go to www.oralert.gov. So O-R-A-L-E-R-T dot G-O-V. And that'll allow you to select the county that you reside in or you work in. So if you, for example, Klamath and Deschutes, if you live in Klamath and work in Deschutes, or vice versa, you can actually access both sites to sign up for alerts for those respective counties. Now, another component, I talked a little bit about WIA. Uh, WIA is a little bit less um, specific. So uh, we, when we use WIA, we generally use it under very certain circumstances where we need to notify people and we're not confident that we'll be able to do so without utilizing WIA. WIA may cross county boundaries. So, for example, the first couple of WIAs that some people received in Deschutes County actually came from Lane County, and those messages were coordinated prior to going out, uh, making sure that we were all on the same page and, and coordinating those messages. Uh, but because it, it was so close to the county line and actually impacting areas just the side of the county line, like along the Pacific Crest Trail and, and the Three Sisters Wilderness area, um, people in, on both sides of the line got those WE alerts. But uh, really the best way to get information, if you, you know, as far as uh, populations or values at risk, if you live in a community is to make sure you go to oralert.gov, um, pick the county that you live or work in, make sure you get signed up and you maintain your profile. Great, thanks very much, thank much, much, Sergeant. And thanks very much, Sheriff Clifford. Thanks to Stephen Myers over at Oregon State Fire Marshals. Rich Tyler, the liaison officer, is also here from the red team. Thanks to Kevin Larkin from the Forest Service and all of our speakers here on behalf of Incident Commander Norm McDonald and our partner team over at Northwest 3 with Incident Commander Randy Johnson and their information officer, Stan Hinatsu. Thank you for being here, for all your concern for the firefighters, their families, and their relatives all watch the comments and posts. So we appreciate all the encouragement you're giving them. They're working long hours and they're here to serve. And we're certainly giving our best out to that night shift out there. <clears throat> we're gonna have 24 seven coverage to make sure we see this fire through. <clears throat> Let's pray for rain, but please drive slowly. Don't exercise in that smoke, it's not good for you. Pay attention to yourself and make sure you're taking care of your friends and neighbors. We're all in this together. We'll come back to you tomorrow with our normal battle rhythm of that 5.30 a.m. post all the way throughout the day, bringing you all the information you need. <clears throat> Call us, email us, and talk to us in person when we're on the trap line. Thank you so much.